The first is Dr. Kimberly Bruce. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes. Uh, Dr. Bruce uh, is a graduate of uh, the PhD program in epigenetics and biochemistry from Portsmouth University in the UK. And she's been here uh, on AMC since 2015, first as an assistant research professor, and now in the uh, tenure track as an assistant professor. Uh, today, she's going to be talking about targeting lipoprotein lipase in neurogenerative disease. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Bruce, uh, please enter it into the chat. Um, and then with that, I'll let uh, Dr. Bruce take it away. Okay, great. Can you all see my screen okay? Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's, you know, it's really exciting to have this opportunity to share some of our work at the Department of Medicine Research and Innovation Conference today. And, and today I'd like to share a little bit of published, but actually mostly unpublished work, where we've been investigating the role of LPL in microglia and whether they could be a target for um, neurogenitive disease. And so as we know, lipoprotein lipase or LPL is a key enzyme in lipid processing. And our work is actually part of a growing body of research, which is um, highlighting how important lipid and lipoprotein processing is to brain health. And so um, we're all aware that the brain is very lipid rich. It's almost 60% lipids. Um, but, if, but in fact, we actually don't know all about how lipids are processed in the brain. We do know, however, even small changes to lipid metabolism in the brain can increase the risk of developing diseases like Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. And this is really important because all these diseases are really devastating and they don't have a cure. And um, many of the treatments that are out there just target some of the symptoms in the disease and not actually the underlying mechanisms. And so of course the etiology of these different diseases is complex, but I would argue that altered lipid processing is a common underlying mechanism where there's really some scope to develop new and effective therapeutic strategies. And so in recent years, there's been some renewed focus in this area, and several major themes have emerged, um, all which alter lipid processing and influence disease risk, um, such as altered lipoprotein processing, particularly when lipoproteins contain ApoE4. We know this is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, lipid droplet accumulation in the brain, lipids as inflammatory mediators, and the clearance and utilization of myelin-derived lipids as well. And so we've learned more about these processes and some and commonalities between them, um, it's become clear that they're driven by a particular cell type. And that's the microglia, the, rain, the brain resident macrophages and key immune effector cells in the brain. And so in recent years, they've really taken center stage. And that's because microglia can actually either promote or prevent many neurogenitive diseases, depending on their phenotype. And I would argue perhaps also how they process lipids. So not only do they contribute to lipoprotein metabolism through, through the uptake and production of lipoproteins, and they're also involved in lipid droplet accumulation. They can use lipids as signaling molecules. And they're also really important for the clearance of myelin-derived lipids. So they really are at the nexus between lipids and disease in the brain. And because of this, there's been a real push to try and identify specific factors that we can target to improve outcomes for neurogenitive disease. And so one approach which has been used to identify these specific um, factors is single cell RNA sequencing. There's been a lot of really important and um, really good um, single cell RNA sequencing studies. And just some of these are uh, summarized in this um, schematic from Hammond et al from their Stevens group. And so if you look during early development, so in periods of active myelination, or if you look in disease pathology, like in the Alzheimer's disease mouse, which has five familial Alzheimer's disease mutations, or if you look in white matter lesions, so in models and paradigms of demyelination, there are microglial subpopulations that pop up. And if you look at the most profoundly upregulated genes in these microglial subpopulations and you overlay them, you see right in the center of this diagram, we see lipoprotein lipase, LPL. And so in light of this, we hypothesize that LPL is a key factor regulating microglial lipid processing in neurogenitive disease. But how does LPL work in the brain? Well, that's something we're still working out. We do know how LPL works in the rest of the body. So just as a quick refresher, we know that LPL is bound to the cell surface. It's tethered by heparin sulfate proteoglycans. And its canonical role is the hydrolysis of triglycerides in triglyceride-rich lipoproteins like BLDL and chylomicrons. 
But actually what's quite important and is often forgotten is that LPL also has phospholipase A1 activity. So it can hydrolyze phospholipids. And that's particularly important when we think of the brain, which has a lot of myelin, which is almost 40% phospholipids. And so these free fatty acids are then taken into the cell where they have different fates, such as fatty acid oxidation. But in addition to this, LPL also has another role, um, a non-hydrolytic function, where it can actually bridge together the lipoproteins and lipoprotein receptors um, to actually bring in these lipoproteins for endocytose, these lipoproteins. So does LPL work in a similar way in the brain and in microglia? Um, well, perhaps, but perhaps no, since we know that in the healthy brain, there aren't many triglyceride-rich lipoproteins floating around. In fact, they're largely absent from the healthy brain. Instead, uh, lipoproteins in the brain largely come from astrocytes, they're glial-derived, and they're more like small HDL-like particles. So it's plausible that LPL could work by hydrolyzing the phospholipids within these HDL lipoproteins, and it could also um, endocytose through this bridging role, this non-hydrolytic role, endocytose these lipoproteins and bringing them into the cell for these downstream fates. Alternatively, there could be other lipid-rich substrates for LPL in the brain, such as myelin. As I mentioned, myelin is 40% phospholipids, um, and it's actively processed in the brain during these contexts, during the disease development, disease, and demyelination, when we see LPL profoundly upregulated. So in light of these hypotheses, our first specific question was, what is the role of LPL in D and remyelination? And so to address this question, we use the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model of D and remyelination, which is a really good model of um, relapsing and relapsing multiple sclerosis. And so this involves injecting myelin oligodendrocyte uh, glycoprotein systemically, which leads to demyelination in the brain and these multiple sclerosis-like symptoms that when we can score over time. And we are able to actually measure the hydrolytic activity of LPL in the whole brain at either 20 days, where we see this peak of multiple sclerosis-like symptoms, or 30 days when we see these symptoms partially recover when we think that remyelination is ongoing. We found that there was no change in LPL activity at this peak, but there was a significant increase in LPL activity at 30 days, suggesting that perhaps um, LPL is important during this remyelination period. Um, but the caveat of this work is that I'm just showing enzyme activity in the total brain tissue. And what we really want to know is what LPL is doing in the microglia. And to better understand this, we had to develop some tools. One of the first tools we developed was a microglial cell line which had lost LPL. And we, when we developed this cell, we were really struck by the marked polarization when we lose LPL. Um, so, uh, for example, we lose the expression of reparative genes such as arginase 1 and YM1, and, um, but we see an increase in pro-inflammatory genes such as INOS. And I really like looking at arginase 1 and INOS because they use the same substrate, and so it's nice to actually look at this switch in microglial polarization. And so what we saw was an increase in INOS, which would suggest more citrulline production and more inflammation. And in fact, when we did the metabolomics, we actually saw increased citrulline. We also saw increased glycolysis and increased cholesterol accumulation in these cells as well, consistent with this uh, pro-inflammatory polarization. And in the other direction, but consistent with this, we also saw reduced fatty acid, ox fatty acid oxidation, reduced monounsaturated fatty acid uptake, and also um, reduced markers of phagocytosis. And so... This is really a summary of several years of work, but taken together, this data suggests that LPL actually plays pleiotropic roles in microglial metabolism and function. It's a key immunometabolic regulator of microglia that leads to microglial polarization. But perhaps one of the most important roles of LPL in the microglia is its role in lipid and lipoprotein uptake. And that sounds quite obvious, but that's not something that had been shown before. We were able to show that in a, in a number of ways. First, we were able to make radio labeled synthetic color microns and monitor the uptake into microglia. So here in panel A, we can see that um, cells that had lost LPL had reduced lipid uptake. We were also able to fluorescently label these particles. And so here, if we look at our cells that had lost L uh, LPL, we can see almost no uptake. But we wanted to use a lipid substrate that was perhaps a little bit more relative to relevant to myelin. So we made some phospholipid-containing vesicles containing a lot of phospholipid choline and phosphatidylserine. 
Um, and we can actually see that when we lose LPL from our microglia, we have significantly less uptake of these um, phospholipid vesicles as well. There's still some uptake, but it's considerably reduced. And so overall, these data suggest that LPL is directly involved in lipid uptake and also the uptake of myelin-associated lipids. So next we asked, is LPL actually involved in the uptake of myelin debris itself? And this is a really important question to ask, since the proper clearance of myelin debris during demyelination is needed for remyelination, and poor myelin clearance is thought to be a really key mechanism driving the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. So we were actually able to quantify myelin phagocytosis in microglial cell lines by supplementing, supplementing them fluorescently labelled myelin debris that we'd isolated um, for mouse brains. And we could actually see that in our cells that have lost LPL, there was significantly less myelin uptake. Um, and we'd shown this with flow sorting. We'd actually shown this in confocal imaging. And we've shown this in cell lines. And we've shown this in um, primary microglial cell lines as well, supporting the fact that LPL is directly involved in myelin phagocytosis. But we, what we really wanted to know is what is the impact of this in vivo? And so to address this, first we had to make a mouse. And we were able to make uh, cross the microglial specific CRE 6 3 cr one with our, floxed, our LPL flux mice to generate this microglial specific LPL knockdown mouse. Uh, we then exposed these mice to this EAE paradigm. So if you remember this multiple sclerosis-like model. And interestingly, in the mice that lack LPL in their microglia, um, they didn't recover from this EAE paradigm as well. So there's um, multiple sclerosis-like scores stay raised throughout the end of the experiment, suggesting that there are some deficits potentially in remyelination ongoing. And again, supporting the fact that microglial LPL is, is important for myelin dynamics. And so we wanted to know a little bit more about the myelin dynamics and how this was changing when we lose LPL from microglia. Um, so we just at baseline without the EAE paradigm, we wanted to see, um, we use fluoromyelin staining and also CARS lipid imaging to actually look at myelin density in the brains of our wild type mice compared to the mice that lost LPL from the microglia. And we actually found um, reduced myelin density in our microglial specific knockdown mice um, using both of these techniques. We also performed lipidomics on myelin extracts from wild type and LPL knockdown mice. And we, could found, we found that almost all the fatty acids re reduced but interestingly, it looked like the monounsaturated fatty acids showed the biggest decline, which is interesting because that recapitulates what we'd seen with our in vitro work as well. And so we do need to do a little bit more work to define this mechanism. But overall, I think it really supports the idea that LPL is involved in myelin turnover, you know, even in the healthy brain. And so, of course, this led us to yet another question. <laughs> is If LPL is needed for myelin clearance and turnover, is myelin itself a trigger for LPL production and secretion? And actually, we've got quite a nice, simple way of measuring this in the lab in vitro. And since we know that LPL is bound to the cell surface of microglia, we can actually release the secreted and surface-bound microglia by incubating our cells with a heparin-containing buffer. The heparin then releases LPL from the cell surface, we can collect this buffer, and then we can directly measure LPL activity using the radiometric assay in the lab. Um, in addition, we can lyse the cells and then also measure the intracellular activity as well. So using this system, we incubated our microglia in vitro with myelin debris for 24 hours. And then we were able to quantify intracellular and extracellular LPL activity. And interestingly found that following myelin supplementation, we saw this big increase in um, LPL activity in the extracellular fraction, but a reduction in the intracellular fraction, suggesting that when we add uh, myelin to our cells, it actually triggers secretion of LPL from the cells. And so um, it suggests here that myelin itself is a trigger for LPL to come to the cell surface where it's needed for phagocytosis of myelin debris. And maybe this is a key process that we can target in multiple sclerosis. But microglial phagocytosis per se is such a core function of microglia that it can be targeted for other disease states as well. Um, such as Alzheimer's disease. And that's actually been another focus of our work. What is the role of LPL in Alzheimer's disease? And interestingly, LPL has been implicated in Alzheimer's disease for some time. 
Um, for example, patients with a loss of function, LPL mutations, such as the 291 mutation here, they actually show increased triglycerides, increased risk, risk of cardiovascular disease, but also increased risk of Alzheimer's disease as well. In contrast, subjects with the 447 gain of function mutation show reduced triglycerides, a reduction in cardiovascular disease risk, and also are less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. So interestingly, this 447 mutation actually exposes the receptor binding site, um, which suggests that it may be involved in this phagocytosis role. Um, and so we think that LPL is important for phagocytosis of myelin debris, but of course it could also be important for other extracellular factors that could be toxic in the brain, such as amyloid beta. And so as we know, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by a buildup of amyloid beta and amyloid plaques that contribute to neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration in the brain. So it's been suggested there are disease-associated microglia, otherwise known as dams, which can wall off these amyloid plaques and prevent further degeneration. And that these dams are actually characterized by um, other lipoprotein and lipid, lipid and lipoprotein factors such as TREM2 and of course LPL. Um, and these dams are phagocytic and potentially protective uh, microglial populations. And so we've actually been able to validate this idea somewhat by using some of the tools we've generated in the lab. Specifically, we've used um, CRISPR-Cas9 mediated LPL knockout microglial cell lines. So this is an additional cell line that we generated before that we've been able to use to recapitulate our findings. And we could actually show that um, cells that have lost LPL um, by CRISPR show reduced uptake of fluorescently labeled um, amyloid, suggesting that LPL is important and needed for amyloid uptake. We've shown this with flow sorting. We've shown this in primary cells with kind of focal imaging. We've shown this in actually a number of uh, models, and it's a, it's a very robust finding. But if you take one message home from this talk today, it's really that LPL has pleiotropic roles in microglia. It's this key immunometabolic regulator of microglia. And so in addition to just phagocytosis, um, I also showed you that LPL is important for lipid and lipoprotein uptake. And this is really important because um, uh, we know that the main genetic driver of Alzheimer's disease is APOE4. And APOE, which is its isoform, <clears throat> is, a main, is the main protein component of brain-derived lipoproteins. So next we asked, how does the APOE4 isoform affect LPL activity and LPL-mediated lipid uptake in microglia? And so to address this, we made synthetic lipoproteins that contained either APOE2, APOE3, or APOE4. And so in the first panel here, we measured LPL hydrolysis um, when it was either APOE2, 3, or 4 contained within the synthetic um, lipoprotein. We could actually see reduced LPL activity when the um, synthetic lipoproteins contained APOE4. Interestingly, this was even further reduced when amyloid beta was um, supplemented as well. And also consistent with this, um, if we actually add these um, APOE4-containing lipoproteins to the cells, they actually get taken up less efficiently. And we've shown this using um, radio-labeled lipoproteins and also fluorescently labeled lipoproteins as well. And so this suggests that APOE4 could actually be inhibiting LPL activity and LPL-mediated lipid uptake, which of course has like major implications for our understanding of Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. Um, and we need to do more work here. Um, but I'm happy to say that we recently received a fundable score on R01, which is actually focused on this work, and we're able to really interrogate this mechanism further. So again, just to pause for a second, um, since a lot of this data I've shown you is ex vivo or in vitro, um, but to further investigate the role of microbial LPL in Alzheimer's disease, we've had to generate a LPL knockout mouse on an Alzheimer's disease susceptible background. This has been a tricky line because they, um, the, the disease accelerates quite rapidly. And so we have repeated this a few times to actually knock out LPL at different time points. Uh, we're still in the process of analyzing these biochemically, but we've actually seen that when we knock out LPL compared to just the Alzheimer's mouse on its own, we do see some exacerbated cognitive decline and we see more anxious behavior um, in op open field tests. So this again is in process. So at this point, I'd like to summarize our data and our working model. Um, we think that LPL is tethered to the cell surface of microglia to heparin sulfate proteoglycans. 
And here at help, LPL has pleiotropic roles. It's directly involved in microglial function by increasing myelin uptake, lipoprotein uptake, um, and either an amyloid beta uptake. And it's indirectly regulating microglial function by regulating metabolism and inflammation. And it's through these roles that we think microglial LPL contributes to homeostasis in the brain and may even be protective. And when we lose LPL, then it may increase our risk of developing neurodegenerative disease. So the next logical question for us um, is, can pharmacological activation of LPL improve microglial function and outcomes in neurogenitive disease? And Joe, just for the last minute, I'd just like to talk to you about a Spark Reach Function Project in collaboration with Dr. Philip Reagan and Skag School of um, Pharmacy, where we've been synth uh, synthesizing small molecule LPL activators to, to, to do just that. And so all these compounds work in a similar way, uh, bind to the ligand binding site of LPL to stabilize the enzyme and prevent endogenous inhibition and to increase LPL activity. And so I'll just show you some of our most promising compounds that we've been working with. And these are um, in the C10D class. So this is actually a known LPL activator, whereas CM354 and CM356 are structurally distinct and have been derived from this. And these compounds all increase the hydrolytic of activity of LPL. Um, but our lead compound, CM354, increases the activity um, by 100 nanomolar, and it can increase that beyond. And we were interested in this compound, so we took it through to some preliminary um, uh, cell assays. Um, and we could actually see that supplementation of microglia with 100 nanomolar CM354 could increase the phagocytosis of amyloid which of course is important for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we've also been talking about phagocytosis of myelin. So we also supplemented both cell lines and primary cells with CM354, 100 nanomolar. We also saw an increase, a significant increase in the uptake of myelin debris as well when we supplemented with the LPL activators. But if you remember, there are pleiotropic roles. It's not just phagocytosis. So we also wanted to see with, whether our small molecule activators could also increase microglial lipid uptake as well. So we supplemented ourselves with um, really small doses, actually, of the CM354, and we could see a significant increase um, in radio labeled in the uptake of radio labeled lipids when we um, supplement with this LPL activator. And so, in light of these findings, we wanted to take these through to some preliminary in vivo experiments. And so we directly injected our LPL activator, um, CM354, into the hippocampus of 5X FAD mice. Um, and we injected in one, the drug in one side and on the other side, it was vehicle. And in our preliminary experiments, we actually found that um, CM354 could actually reduce amyloid load around the hippocampus. I'm really excited to now expand these studies, do some larger in, in vivo studies, and treat different and treat the mice at different Alzheimer's disease stages with these LPL activators. So just quickly to round up the talk, um, uh, I'd like to bring us back to this clinical problem. And that's the fact that these neurogenitive diseases are multifactorial. And perhaps that's why we haven't been able to find a big blockbuster therapy for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. There's lots of mechanisms at play, increased amyloid accumulation, um, reduced lipoprotein clearance, altered lipid and cholesterol homeostasis. So what's so good about targeting LPL and arguably you know, lipid processing in microglia generally is that we can target many of these processes at the same time. So that's our goal, that by increasing LPL activity, we can restore lipid homeostasis in, the, in microglia to kind of prevent neurogenitive disease development and progression. So that just leads me to thank the folks in the lab that, of course, been instrumental in carrying out this work, um, and my mentor, Bob Eckel, who's been fantastic, a great team of ment uh, other mentors and collaborators at Anschutz and beyond, our funders. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bruce, for that uh, really interesting talk. Um, uh, uh, and again, if there's any questions, please enter it into the chat. Um, and while we're waiting for that, maybe a, a question I can start is, so what, what do you think would be the series of experiments that would be needed as kind of the next steps to then be able to potentially test it in humans, these um, LPL activators? Uh, well, that's, yeah, that's an important question. So our preliminary experiments We've been using the 5XFAD model of Alzheimer's disease 
um, to see whether we we could reduce amyloid load. Um, and that's involved some direct <laughs> infusion into the brain, which may not be the, the easiest way to go around it. Um, so we've been considering other routes of administration um, going forward. We might want to think about potentially intranasal delivery. Um, and also another thing to consider is obviously, do we should we also be thinking about APOE4 carriers and whether this is another a region, place in which we can specifically target. And so actually the, the grant that hopefully will be coming to us soon, you know, that's a big part of that. We want to be able to, you know, do the, we need to do more preclinical studies where we're testing additional routes of administration. We're testing in the um, the, the 5X FAD mouse model, but it, we know that these aren't the best models. So we will probably have to, we probably should test in an, an additional mouse model as well um, and consider um, testing in the APOE4 um, uh, transgenic mice to see actually what the effect there is. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then there's a question in the chat. Um, have you looked at microRNAs to upregulate LPL activity? Um, no, I haven't looked at that. Um, we are looking, and that's really interesting. Um, and there's microRNAs that, no, that don't just regulate LPL, but they also regulate the activators of LPL and the endogenous inhibitors of LPL. So that's something that I've thought about. It's actually really interesting. And um, we are thinking about modulating those endogenous activators rather than just in addition to just the small molecules as well. So we're thinking about those other avenues of health regulation, but that's an interesting question, thank you. Great, well, thank you, Dr. Bruce.